Welcome, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you out there. Welcome to this uh, webinar on democratic backsliding. Uh, the webinar will present and discuss the new book by Professors Haggard and Kaufman entitled Backsliding, Democratic Regress in the Contemporary World, published by Cambridge University Press. Promise to become a highly interesting uh, webinar with many participants from many different uh, countries, so that's great. We want to organize this webinar in an interactive manner, and if you have questions, you can send them to us via the chat box at the bottom of the webinar panel, and we will feed them into the discussion. This webinar is an organization of the Reconnect project. Um, some of you uh, might already be familiar with it, but allow me to say a few um, words on the Reconnect project. This project is funded by the Horizon 2020 uh, uh, funding mechanism of the European Commission and is fully entitled Reconciling Europe with its citizens through democracy and the rule of law. We bring together 18 academic partner institutions from 14 countries. And the key aim is to understand and provide solutions to recent crises faced by the European Union, some of which include quite flagrant cases of democratic and rule of law backsliding. And we actually want to have discussions on these issues and also try to come up with some uh, recommendations. Over the past three years, we have been very active in organizing discussions on these topics, and we really want to continue doing that. We can act as a project very much focused on, on the European Union. However, we have also noticed that many of the developments we are now um, observing in the European Union also play out in other countries of the world. And hence, we have launched um, a, a series of webinars on democratic and rule of law, backsliding causes, consequences, and prospects from around the world to also learn and gain insight on developments in other parts of the world. The idea is to take stock of some of these major developments in specific countries and regions uh, with regard to rule of law and democracy backsliding. And each time we intend to invite leading experts to give insights on some key developments and, and events. Today we have with us uh, Professor Haggard of the University of California, San Diego, and Professor Kaufman of Rutgers University to talk about the latest book on democratic backsliding, which is based on a number of detailed case studies, including the United States, Eastern Europe, and Africa. Together, Professor Haggard and Kaufman are the authors of several books, including The Political Economy of Democratic Transitions, Development, Democracy, and Welfare States, Latin America, East Asia, and Eastern Europe Compared, Dictators and Democrats, Elites, Masses, and Regime Changes, which was published in 2016. And today they will be talking about the very latest and new book, A Backsliding Democratic Regress in the Contemporary World. Do not forget, if you have any questions for Professor Kaufman and Professor Haggard, please feel free to send them into the chat box and the Q&A section, and we then uh, will also pose them uh, to them. We will first have a presentation of approximately 25 minutes. Then we will follow up with your questions and a Q&A. And the webinar will end at 4.45 Brussels time. Now it's my great pleasure to hand over to Professor Haggard. Axel, uh, th thanks so much for, for organizing this. I, I can't tell you how pleased we are, and, and particularly to give this before a European audience, because Bob and I have worked mainly in the developing world, and as a result of that, uh, it, was a, it was a challenge to, to learn what we needed to learn about Eastern Europe and, and the Balkans. Let me just give a very brief uh, back uh, sociology of knowledge of how we got here. Bob and I wrote this book called Dictators and Democrats, which was published uh, several years ago. And then Bob and I started to talk about what was happening in the United States because it was clear that something was going badly wrong under the Trump administration. Most political scientists were aware of that. And then that led us back to what we had said about other middle income developing countries because they were the only relevant comparators unless we went back to the interwar period. 
And so that gave rise to this effort to uh, do something on the topic of backsliding. Uh, and that's this short book that I'll be talking about. So uh, the, the background to this is this new form of political change or democratic regress, which has emerged over the last several decades. And if we look at the sweep of post-war history, most democracies fell to coups. Uh, but in the last uh, two decades, we've seen this new form of regress, which is undertaken by duly elected democratic leaders. And we define it as the incremental erosion of democratic institutions, rules, and norms that are undertaken by leaders who are elected in elections that, uh, at least initially, are free and fair. And once in office, these executives initiate processes which go after the constitutive components of democratic rule which we basically define uh, in these three core baskets, uh, horizontal checks on the executive, uh, leading to a phenomenon we call the collapse of the separation of powers, political rights and civil liberties, including media freedom as a quite core component of that. And ultimately, and as a bedrock foundation of democracy, attacks on the integrity of the electoral system. And of course, uh, any of our American colleagues who are listening know that the United States experienced all of these uh, in varying degrees uh, during the, the Trump years. Uh, well, I need to say, however, that there's a debate, and I'll talk about this, uh, about whether this process necessarily uh, results in a reversion to authoritarian rule. Our answer to that is no. Um, but even if democracy is weakened in the ways we describe, it's obviously of something uh, is of something is something of, of interest to us. So let me say uh, just a little about the method of the book. Uh, I'm um, I've gotten interested in qualitative methods uh, in the course of working on these last uh, several projects with Bob. Um, but what we do in the book is we select on the outcome, that is, we're choosing cases that we define as having slid backwards, and we analyze those cases primarily. And we tried to come up with a definition that could be um, validated by existing uh, quantitative data sets and measures. And so basically, we took cases, we took all countries, uh, that had at least eight years cross, crossing a threshold using VDEM data on the Electoral Democracy Index, and then looked at subsequent declines from those peak scores. And so backsliding was defined as a, a, a taking place in the context of a democracy that was con consolidated to at least some extent but then subsequently saw regress along these various uh, dimensions. We also uh, cross-tabulated this with several other data sets to make sure that these judgments weren't uh, idiosyncratic. And uh, those rules are contained in an appendix, which I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit. But this gave rise to this incredibly heterogeneous group of countries uh, that spanned several continents, actually. Bolivia, Brazil, the Dominican Republic, Ecuador, Hungary, obviously, Poland, Russia, the United States, Ukraine. Um, so we were just really surprised at the diversity of countries that met this particular metric. And those became the focal point um, of the study. Now, um, those of you who are comparativists might uh, raised red flags about selecting on the dependent variable as we did here. Um, we did include some comparative analysis of backsliding against regional benchmarks. So we would compare Hungary and Poland with other European cases, for example, with respect to some particular parameter, whether it's polarization or the rule of law. But our primary focus is what we call within case causal inference. That is, we have a postulated set of causal factors that we thought were at work in these cases. 
and we basically undertook a large N qualitative analysis of conducting detailed uh, case analysis of each of these cases, which combined narrative with simple uh, descriptive statistics. Um, I'll just uh, give you an example of the type of, of data that was made relevant here, and it shows you the type of processes we're looking at. These are measures of polarization in Brazil, for example, uh, leading up to 2016. Brazil uh, begins its backsliding episode actually prior to the election of Bolsonaro. Uh, and you can see that there's an increase in polarization during this period. Uh, by these measures um, from the VDEM data set. And in a sense, what we're doing is we're triangulating between these, uh, these quantitative measures and a narrative of exactly how these um, processes unfolded. I wanted to say something briefly about the appendix, because those of you who are interested in these cases, uh, we hope that this is a resource that might be valuable to you. Uh, in addition to the book, which is fairly short, it's, it's about um, 35,000 words, there's a very long online appendix which provides quantitative information on the cases that we look at, as well as narratives on each of the country cases. And so, for example, here you can see a thumbnail of, of the path of democracy scores in the cases of interest to us. And on the right, you see the first page of the Turkey case, which sets up uh, an extended discussion of the Erdogan period. Uh, let me turn now to, to the causal argument of the book. Um, and it's contained in this diagram. And I, I just want to direct your attention to the, the flow of arrows that run along the left-hand side of the screen, because each of these um, processes correspond to a chapter in the book. We start with political polarization as a, a background condition that seems to pertain in all of these cases. And we'll talk about how polarization has the effect of, of um, leading and setting the stage for most of the, if not all, of the backsliding episodes that we, we talk about. Uh, autocrats obviously have to win office. We refer to backsliding executives as autocrats. Uh, they don't necessarily succeed in their autocratic projects, but we see executives as quite central, of course. So we talk about the electoral circumstances in which autocrats rise to power. But probably one of the most important contributions of the book, in our view, is uh, the attention that we focus on legislators and legislatures as enabling factors in the backsliding process. A lot of attention has been given to autocrats uh, and these charismatic figures are obviously quite important in this process, but they, um, because these systems are democratic to begin with, legislatures actually play an important role. And ironically, they weaken themselves typically in the course of backsliding. Um, their ability to serve as checks on executive discretion is actually diminished over the course of time. And then finally, we um, talk about this incremental process by which uh, le legislatures and, and executives cooperate to undertake these uh, purposeful institutional changes with respect to the separation of powers, rights, liberties, and the integrity of the electoral system. So, what I'm gonna do for the rest of the time is walk through each of these um, chapters and segments quickly, uh, providing you an overall picture uh, rather than going into any particular cases. And we can come back to the cases to the extent that we hold them in our head um, in the, in the Q&A. So with respect to polarization, um, one of the points I, I want to emphasize at the outset is that we're actually agnostic on the ultimate sources of elite and mass polarization. Um, that is, this is not a book which is making an argument that economics dominates or that ethnicity dominates or race dominates or cultural resentment dominates. 
Um, to paraphrase Tolstoy, unhappy countries are all unhappy in their own particular way. Um, for example, in Greece or Venezuela or the United States, economic shocks were obviously quite important. Um, in Zambia and Turkey, uh, ethnic and religious uh, factors came into play. And I think in the post-communist states in particular, uh, broader cleavages between nationalist and cosmopolitan values um, were implemented, uh, implicated in the, the polarization process. But the most important point, I think, is that as this polarization deepens, uh, many cleavages within society start to load on a single dimension, a binary which pits us versus them. Uh, and polarization, as the work of Yungar and McCoy, Raman, and Summer points out, really becomes almost an issue of identity. And those of you who have followed American politics, there's been some incredible research showing, for example, that if you're a Democrat, having your daughter marry a Republican is more distasteful than marrying someone from a minority group. And this kind of identity politics is often deeply implicated in the backsliding process for reasons uh, I'll explain. Now, um, polarization has a number of consequences, adverse consequences, and we set this up as tracing what some of those are. It contributes directly to government dysfunction, um, particularly, I think, in presidential systems. It makes it extremely difficult to get things done. Uh, it undermines faith in political institutions. And of course, by definition, it weakens the center of the political system and incentivizes anti-system anti and populist appeals that demonize oppositions. But I'd say the one thing that we focus on um, it, as a result of polarization is the emergence of what we call majoritarian conceptions of democracy. And this is the idea that democratic majorities should not be impeded in any way from doing what they want. Uh, there's an interesting intellectual history here that goes back to the Republican tradition uh, with respect to how democratic majorities and democracy are conceived. But um, uh, we, and I in particular, was very influenced by some modeling by, by Milan Sfole, which makes this very simple point then in highly polarized systems, um, supporters of one side or the other are more likely to acquiesce to bad elite behavior precisely because they, they see the opposition in extremely threatening terms. And so polarization really has a corrosive effect on democracy because it primes parts of the public to accept democratic regress because the adversary um, is seen uh, as an enemy. And uh, this, this, this again, for those of you interested in the history of political theory, these ideas uh, can be traced back to people like uh, Carl Schmitt in the interwar period that talked about politics as a conflict between um, friends and enemies. Turning to the second uh, basket of causal factors, um, you know, we focus on legislatures and what might be called the legislative irony, which is that autocratic control of legislatures, um, and this in presidential systems, this can be when you have unified government, but it also extends to parliamentary systems where autocrats control their parties very directly and have a lot of uh, inter-party control and discretion, that uh, one result of this is that the legislatures themselves uh, tend to uh, weaken. And we see a variety of this, uh, we, we see this phenomenon emerging in a variety of ways in the cases we examined. In Venezuela, Bolivia, and Ecuador, uh, autocrats actually established parallel constitutive assemblies, which played this function. But we see uh, oppositions failing to coalesce, uh, disproportionality playing a role in uh, these autocratic movements gaining legislative power. 
And I should say that these victories are often narrow. Um, for example, where you have disproportional electoral rules, it's possible for a party to gain not only a majority of seats, but a super majority of seats with a small share of the popular electoral vote. Uh, and this was a sort of surprising result, the extent to which disproportionality played an important role in backsliding, including, I should add, in the United States, because of course the Electoral College has this, these important disproportional uh, features. And we've now had three elections in the United States in which the popular vote has gone to uh, one party and the executive office has ultimately been, been held by the, by the other. Uh, now, um, when legislators acquiesce to, um, to uh, autocrats, a number of things happen. Um, first, obviously, the oversight function that legislatures play. And again, this may vary somewhat between parliamentary and presidential systems, but it obviously weakens. Uh, you get support uh, for appointments both to the judiciary, but quite importantly to the executive branch. Uh, and and th those appointments become sources of power for the autocrat as the autocrat kind of uh, colonizes the civil service, undermining in some cases the integrity of civil service legislation. And then, of course, uh, in extremists, you can get the delegation of powers outright to presidents. Uh, think of Venezuela or Turkey or, or Russia, uh, or to party leaders in parliamentary systems, as in Hungary, where the power that the, that the autocrat has over the party itself is uh, strengthened. And this can even extend to the relaxation of term limits, which we see in a number of backsliding cases where legislatures basically either uh, initiate referenda or directly engage in constitutional reforms that um, uh, allow autocrats to expand their powers. So there are a whole cluster of, of things here that are quite interesting about the role that legislatures play in the backsliding process that we think needs um, more attention. Now, finally, um, and I'm getting close to, to the end here, I want to say something about incrementalism because backsliding, uh, if you recall, we define as an incremental process of chipping away at the um, norms and rules of democratic restraint. Uh, so it might seem odd to say that incrementalism also is a causal factor in the backsliding process, but we think it is, um, and, and for two separate reasons. The first is that the components of democratic rule, uh, these large features that are defining of democracy, rights, uh, and liberties, horizontal checks on power, um, and of course the integrity of the electoral system itself, these are mutually constitutive of one another. So if an autocrat is capable of undermining the judiciary, they're not only weakening horizontal checks on the executive, they're also diminishing the ability of the courts to uphold the rights of citizens, including their most basic rights, of assembly, of freedom of speech and petition. And so attacking one feature of the democratic complex, so to speak, uh, subsequently has the effect of, of weakening other parts of the democratic complex. Uh, and so one interesting question, which I don't think we answered uh, adequately, is whether there are particular sequences in backsliding. Um, we did appear to notice that the media and judiciary played an important role in the onset of these processes. Um, but then obviously the end game is typically in undermining the integrity of the electoral system. And so this is a, an interesting question for further research is, is there an optimal strategy from the perspective of an autocrat in undermining democratic rule? But there's a second reason why we think that incrementalism is an important feature of backsliding. And that has to do with a social psychology 
uh, one of the things living through the Trump era, uh, it, it was a very disorienting time uh, because behaviors which we once thought were completely beyond the pale were normalized. And they were normalized by the media. They were normalized by the nature of discourse and including disinformation. So you got used to seeing outright lies propagated um, through, through the presidency. And you get used to this. And you don't realize that this is, in fact, a derogation from democratic norms, or at least some part of the public doesn't realize that this is a derogation from democratic norms. And this disorientation of publics and oppositions this repeated question of, is this happening, um, plays a very crucial role in backsliding. And I'll make a European reference here, which I think everyone on this call is aware of, is that the European Union itself is in this difficult circumstance of dealing with uh, incremental derogations on the part of two of its members, perhaps more, frankly, uh, and asking, is this going on? To what extent is this going on? At what point do we act? And each time the autocrat gets away with something, obviously, then that derogation is normalized and it makes it harder in the next stage to uh, take a firmer stance. So I think there's a lot of work here to be done on the social psychology of backsliding. Uh, those of you who are graduate students and looking for dissertations, uh, you know, this is a place where experiments really could uh, play an interesting research role. What, what will people accept under certain circumstances? And I have some students that are working in that vein now at UCSD. Uh, this is just showing the, 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 the incrementalism of this process. Venezuela is obviously one of the great tragedies of Latin American politics over the last several decades. Uh, but this is a process which went on for, for over a decade in Venezuela with you know, a slow incremental decline into outright authoritarian rule. Okay, my last slide, because I really want to hear from you. Um, let me just raise a few uh, issues for debate and future research. Um, one of the questions that we think is very important about backsliding is, is whether it's stable. And by that, I mean, is it possible for a democracy to backslide and to what extent and remain democratic at its core? Now, this is a very you know, interesting question. Um, we took a very rigorous approach to our case selection. And the result of that is we had some quite ambiguous cases in the data set. Uh, in particular, there's, I, I think, still quite substantial debate over whether any period of, of Greek politics under Syriza actually constituted backsliding or not. We ended up coming to a somewhat skeptical conclusion in that regard, uh, itself uh, uh, partly a result of, of incrementalism. Uh, and, and Greece obviously bounced back. Uh, other countries in the Balkans have bounced back. Uh, so, you know, this question of whether backsliding is stable and what might block it is, is an interesting question. Um, you know, the United States survived, institutions held in some ways, but nonetheless, this is a diminished democracy. Or it feels that way to us. Uh, how do we think about that? The second set of questions, obviously, is the international context of all this. Um, backsliding is taking place in the context of the emergence of authoritarian great powers. Uh, those authoritarian great powers have an interest in dividing democracies, both from one another and internally. Uh, my current research project is on authoritarian international institutions, which are proliferating in the world. And in a paper with Christina Cotiero, we're showing that, that, uh, that these organizations can have adverse effect on the prospects for democracy. And of course, there's this broader question of whether democracy is appealing uh, and whether it's, it's to be emulated. It's difficult for the United States to stand up for democracy promotion when it itself is seeing events such as those on January 6th. Uh, in the capital. 
And so this question of the international context of democracy is obviously quite uh, central. And then I see my time is up, so I'll just make one last point. I think, you know, the, one of the questions that emerged uh, in this project to me, and I think it's one I think about more as a citizen than a political scientist, honestly, is the social psychology of democracy. Uh, can it survive in a world in which truth itself is up for grabs? And obviously, a central factor in this is our uh, better understanding the new technology uh, and the way in which information is now disseminated, not only through the so-called mainstream media uh, and, and these institutions of truth generation, uh, universities, uh, the media, and social media platforms in which uh, claims are, are, can be made without contestation or accountability. And how do we think about that? How do we think about the role of the social media platforms in the backsliding process? If we had more time in the book and now, I would probably spend it on trying to understand those processes. Uh, Axel, thanks again so much to you and the Leuven Center and Reconnect for having us. Uh, we really look forward to uh, entertaining your questions. Thank you very much, Stephen, for a very comprehensive and insightful presentation and a very good introduction to the uh, to, to the book. We actually got a, a lot of questions in, so I will start uh, feeding them in uh, uh, immediately to you. Some of the questions are related to some uh, specific current cases, maybe not the cases you deal with in the book, but some developments uh, going on. There are a few uh, questions on conceptualization and, and, and methods. And then there was also, but you already touched a bit upon it, on, on, on let's say the, the consequences uh, of democratic backsliding. Maybe I will start off with a, first with a few questions on, um, on conceptualization and, and bit more the methodological part of, of what you've been doing. Well, the first question um, is how is polarization defined and measured in the book? What is defined as non-polarization? Uh, what are considered, let's say, cohesive centrist uh, democracies? Can you say a few more words about that? Uh, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to allow my colleague Bob Kaufman to field some of these questions. But Bob, uh, feel free to turn anything back to me if you if you choose. Yeah, well, thank you, and thank you, Axel, for the invitation. Um, and Steph, a great presentation, if I say so. So, um, so on polarization, uh, we borrow very heavily from uh, work that's been done by uh, McCoy and Robin and. Uh, and some others and I, again i'll just repeat what haggard says about about it that the bottom line is uh that it's a process that divides society um uh, not so much over specific issues but you know into what some people have called tribes so their their identities um that really define positions on issues define positions vis-a-vis -vis the other size. Uh, now, the way we have tried to get at this empirically uh, is through use of the VDEM data. And VDEM has a number of indicators that kind of capture some elements of polarization. Most directly, they have an indicator on uh, social, uh, social polarization, so that uh, sets it up. But there are some others that relate uh, as well. Uh, hate speech, uh, respect for counter arguments and um, anti system movements are the other three indicators that we use. Um, and um, we look for two things as we look at these indicators. One is whether there is a, a significant increase in um, the polarization measures uh, in the years prior to the onset of backsliding. Or, and or whether there's an increase uh, in the first, I think it's two years. So this would capture kind of cases in which, both in cases in which uh, you get a kind of an escalation of conflict over time that an autocrat um, kind of rides uh, 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 into. Uh, 
uh, and the extent to which it's a process that is kind of stoked from above. Usually it's some combination. Now, um, the part of the question was, why do we, how do we know whether this is, uh, the, the, how much of a problem this is? And what we do do is use regional benchmarks of polarization so that in all of our cases, uh, our measures of polarization significantly are significantly worse uh, than uh, regional averages. That would be true in the Eastern European cases vis-a-vis -vis Europe, be true in Latin America vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Latin American averages and so forth. I think I've answered that. Okay, thank you. Uh, another one on, on, on measurement and conceptualization has to do uh, with uh, the emergence of the majority and conception of democracy, which you mentioned in, in, the, in the presentation. Is that in any way measured in the book? That's How do good, you yeah. identify um, the emergence of majority and conceptions? That's a great question. And Steph, you can correct me, but I don't think we tackled uh, uh, an effort to systematically measure that. Uh, what we do do uh, in some detail in the country narratives and the appendix is talk uh, uh, in a qualitative way about the appeal used by autocrats and which we kind of make the emphasis that that they um, uh, claim uh, to represent the people majority you know majority uh, uh, and see their uh, opposition as uh, in league with uh, with the, the corrupt elite uh, with uh, or with foreign elites but no, no, there's no measurement of that. Yeah, let me let me uh, let me just uh, uh, jump in on this very very briefly. I think it's in in chapter two. I maybe yeah, I think it's in chapter two. Um, one of the reasons we decided not to look for a common taproot of a particular type of of polarization cleavage is because we did find these examples running across the gamut. And I, I think we, we divide um, the nature of these appeals into a kind of left populism and a right populism, with left populism emerging around class distinctions, inequalities, uh, and material uh, concerns, and then a more diffuse uh, cluster of right populist cases in which ethnicity, race, religion, and ultimately, I think nationalism uh, and anti-cosmopolitan views dominate. And so we do try to characterize the electoral appeals of autocrats along these dimensions and show that they have majoritarian components. But I also want to uh, underline that this is a qualitative book. I mean, this is a book which is based around narrative accounts of what's happening in these cases as well as around um, some of the quantitative work, which is frankly descriptive. Um, there's a lot of econometric work in Dictators and Democrats, but, but that's not the, the route uh, that we went here for the, for the, for the most part. Now, one, one real quick final point on this. Um, just the, I want to point, note the irony here, uh, that there are majoritarian claims, uh, or at least we argue there are, uh, but many of these, um, Autocrats are elected by minority votes. I, I don't know the exact number of cases, but there are a lot of them which do not get an actual majority. Okay, many thanks. Then there's a, um, a question related basically to the starting point, and that also brings us back to polarization. Starting point of the book is that it's basically a question about agency and structure. And if you start out with, let's say, um, polarization as one of the initial conditions driving these processes and, and mechanisms, the question is whether that some kind of as a structural condition does not underplay the degree to which specific agents drive these processes. And there's a reference to what happened in the US with Trump uh, to Orban in, in Hungary. And does that not in a way, um, in a, to a degree, diminish the 
important role very specific agents play in the whole uh, process of backsliding? That's a great question, and we've gone back and forth over it, and, you know, maybe we've, I don't know whether we've resolved it, but uh, we, I mean, one thing we do argue is that there are uh, actors in the system, sometimes at the national level, but often at the grassroots level, who are stoking antagonism. So this is not an agentless process. Uh, but we also believe that um, they need markets, they need political markets. And so um, uh, in the United States, for example, there are, as everyone knows, longstanding racial cleavages. Now, these do not necessarily have to become polarized. But, you, you know, we, we know since at least the, the 1960s that there are political actors at both the national and local le uh, level that uh, stoke those antagonisms. So it's it's both. I mean, there's it's a supply and demand process. Okay, thank you. Even you want to add something or? No, I think I think our metaphor is not agent structure. I, I think our, our metaphor is supply. Now, there, there are underlying cleavages that someone has to mobilize them. And, and I think it's, you know, to focus on one side of that equation versus the other, it's like one hand clapping. Okay, then there's a question on whether you looked at, let's say, interactions between cases in the sense that some of these mechanisms you identify or political tactics spill over from one case to another, if you have looked yeah. into Oh. Yeah, let me let me take that up because this is something I'm currently interested in. Look, I'll be honest with you. The short answer to that is no, in the sense that um, we don't explicitly, and I emphasize explicitly, uh, deal with these questions of emulation. But that said, we do more informally. And I'll just point out several clusters, for example, uh, or let me just focus on one. It's very clear that Chavez was emulated in Ecuador and even in Nicaragua um, and, uh, uh, and in Bolivia. And you can really trace that process. But, but we confess that, that this is a theme which is an important one we recognize in the conclusion, uh, but it doesn't motivate or receive focused treatment in the context of the book. And there are many other mechanisms, by the way. I mean, these international uh, authoritarian international institutions are a current preoccupation of mine. And I think these are extremely dangerous, actually, and, and are starting to get the attention they deserve. OK, uh, uh, maybe a, a question related to that is that, do you see in any of the cases you studied how this shift towards, let's say, more authoritarian states had an effect on the foreign policies these states developed? I'm not sure. I'm uh, Actually, the, the sound is a little off. So it, it, the question is, does the decline of democracy into authoritarianism affect policy? Foreign yeah, and policy. especially foreign policy. Foreign policy. Yeah. Uh, well, again, this is a question that Steph can answer probably better than I can, but uh, Autocrats need international allies, and uh, so clearly, I mean, there's some obvious examples, uh, both uh, in Hungary, for example, uh, or in Turkey, where you see a kind of a, ro a growing uh, rapprochement with this with the Russia. Um, uh, you know, there's sort of mutual assistance, and I think that in the case of Latin America, the Latin American cases. It's also clear that the, the countries that have undergone backsliding um, have moved closer to international autocracies like Russia and China, uh, and also closer to each other. So yes, there is clearly a, an effect. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I still have quite a few questions. I propose I... Uh give them to you via email and then we can see if we can follow up on, on, on some of those. But we are now running towards the end of our time at this webinar. I want to thank you both very much for a very insightful webinar and discussion, especially also for 
the book you made, which has uh, a lot of interesting insights and really digs into the causal mechanisms and complexities of, of things happening, and which actually for our Reconnect project are also very relevant and interesting to see what the dynamics are here in, in, in Europe. So thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you very much for the book and being with us uh, today. We will have a next webinar in our series on, on uh, uh, developments around the world, and that will be on the 17th of March with Professor Mukherjee from Heidelberg University, who will then talk about developments in India specifically. And I hope many of you uh, out there can join us for that webinar as well. You can follow uh, the developments and the announcements for that webinar via our website of Reconnect, but all you registered today and in the case they wanted to be kept up to date will also uh, receive an invitation for the next webinar. So Professor Kaufmann, Professor Haggard, thank you very much for your contribution and uh, we'll be in touch. Thanks for providing us the opportunity. We really appreciate it. Bye. Bye.